And there's a list of them all. We called the safe wards interventions, we called them the organizational interventions, uh, and the control interventions, we called the well-being interventions. So they had neutral titles, and nobody could tell which were the ones that we thought that uh, we were considering to be the experimental interventions. Uh, this wasn't just me working on this big study with all of these different wards. That's all of the team that worked on the safe wards trial. Well, not quite all of the team because I'm not in the picture. The statistician, the clinical trials unit uh, is not in the picture. The trial steering committee and the representatives from various nursing bodies and the trusts who had oversight uh, of the trial is not in that picture either. Neither in the picture are all of the people who consented to being the study and were in the, all of the wards that participated in the study. So that's quite a lot of people, really. And if you think doing this trial is just a matter of going to the wards and asking them to do it and they do it, you'd be terribly wrong because eight months before we even started, we had to go and talk to the senior managers about whether it was a possibility to run the trial in their hospitals. And then we had to go to meetings of all of their ward managers and give them early notification that the trial was heading in their direction and asking them to support it, in fact, winning their support for it. Um, we had, in the end, 31 wards in the trial. We were aiming for 15 hospitals, two wards at each hospital, which would have been 30. But when we went to one hospital, they had three wards, and they told us, we're going to close ward A. Then the next time we went to visit, us, visit them, they told us they were going to close ward B. Then the third time when we went to visit them, they told us they were going to close ward A. So we recruited all of the wards into the study. Uh, and in the end, they didn't close any of those wards. So all three made it through to the other end of the study. So that's how we ended up with 31 wards. Uh, lots of the hospital organizations uh, deferred or delayed various changes, various initiatives that they were going to make in order for our trial to take place. Uh, all of the wards responded and reacted very, very differently to the study. Uh, and there were occasional major changes in the course of the study. For example, one of the wards was burnt down by a patient during the course of the study. Uh, she set fire to her bedroom in the middle of the night. The ward had to be evacuated. Uh, one of the nursing staff was admitted to hospital with smoke inhalation. And the entire ward and all of its staff had to be moved to another site. And then because that was a temporary accommodation, they had to be moved to yet again another site before they finally went back to their original location. And yeah, I'm very proud to say that ward continued with the Safe Wards trial all the way through. They continued submitting their end of shift reports. They continued doing the questionnaires. And they continued doing the interventions. I think that's, that's thoroughly impressive. You can see here very nearly 60, 600 staff gave their signed consent to the study. Not all of them, but the majority of staff who were working on those wards. They returned just over 8,000 end of shift reports in the course of the study, which was just over half of the potential total. And they returned nearly 3,000 additional questionnaires. And all of that information had to be scanned into a computer and then double checked to absolutely make sure it was accurate uh, and was exactly what people had told us. This is the main outcome. This is what happened. Conflict went down on the experimental wards relative to the controls by 15%, very nearly, and containment went down by 24% relative to the controls. So our trial was a success. We made a substantial difference to the rates of conflict and containment on those wards. Not total. Nobody will ever eradicate all conflict and containment. But this made a major difference to those wards that participated in the trial that were doing the safe wards interventions. And all those numbers underneath there tell you that this was statistically very significant. It was not due to chance that these differences were found. These are really, really um, quite strong. Uh, we then had to do a lot of further statistical work to make sure, well, could there be other explanations for this? Well, maybe some of those wards that had the, you know, a few major changes, maybe the inclusion of that ward that had the fire, for example, had some impact on the overall results. So we tried dropping those wards from the analysis and then doing our analysis again. And what you find is the safe wards intervention is still has a significant effect. 
uh, we looked at the missing data because not always at the end of every shift did we get our end of shift reports. Was it a possibility that on those occasions that we didn't get our end of shift reports, it was because the ward was more disturbed? Or was there a lack of an end of shift report because the ward was less dis uh, disturbed? And did that bias our results in any way? So we did all kinds of statistical checks about the missing data to see if that explained these differences between the experimental and the control wards. And it didn't. Basically, whatever we threw at in terms of a challenge, whatever we threw at our data and made it look at, we couldn't undermine the result that we achieved. So this really is a, a very strong and a very sound result. This was really an effect of those 10 safe wards interventions that we asked people to do. Uh, we were less successful with the questionnaires. So we didn't find any difference in the ward atmosphere scale. We didn't find any change in attitudes to patients, really, uh, although we found some changes that occurred on both the control and the experimental wards. We didn't find any changes in attitudes to self-harm in reality between the two different groups. We did find one change. <clears throat> uh, the SF36 measured the mental health and the physical health of nursing staff who were participating in the trial. And it didn't matter whether you were working on the experimental or the control wards, there was no change to anybody's mental health status throughout the course of the trial, not in general. But we did find a change in the physical health status. Those nurses who were working on the control wards, who were doing all of those desk exercises and getting the individual diet advice, they really did improve their physical health. Their physical health was measurably better at the end of the trial than it had been before the trial started. So if you want to turn our trial upside down and say this was a test of an intervention to improve the physical health of staff, then it worked that way as well. Uh, this is interesting because this tells you a little bit more, it digs a, a little bit more underneath the bottom of the data and tells you what was really going on in the course of this research trial. Uh, remember I told you we had our researchers going to the wards and looking for actual evidence that people were doing the different interventions. So they'd look for evidence of each of the 10 safe wards interventions. They'd also look for evidence of the pedometer competition and see whether our healthy snacks had been eaten and that the magazines and the notices were still there. Uh, what this data showed was that on average we only got the safe wards interventions up to about a 38% implementation or 38% uh, intensity. So there were lots of people and lots of nurses on the wards who were not, cooperate, not necessarily cooperating or, or not implementing the interventions that we were asking them to do. We only got to 40% intensity with the safe wards interventions by actual observation. Uh, and yet we still got the results that we got in terms of reducing conflict and containment. So what that suggests, it, it, there's two lessons here. It means you can implement safe wards even where you've not got the full cooperation of all of the staff that you're working with, and it will still have an effect. That's lesson number one. Uh, lesson number two would be it takes longer than eight weeks to implement the safe wards interventions, and that tallies with our uh, experience of people implementing safe wards since the trial completed. It takes about six months to a year for a ward to fully implement those 10 interventions in a really... Uh, rigorous and reliable fashion. Uh, what else does it tell us? It, tell, it suggests that if you were to in, uh, implement them at 100%, you might get a better effect on rates of conflict and containment. Uh, if you look at our end of study questionnaire, we gave everybody a questionnaire right at the end of the study about all of the different interventions, and we asked them which of them they did and which of them they didn't did and which they thought was the best and the worst and all the rest of it. People who filled out those said that they were implementing them to 89% intensity. So people were, who completed the end of study questionnaire were very positive. But if you think about it, it's only the more enthusiastic people who are likely to answer the questionnaire at the end of the study about what they were doing. So that's probably a biased figure. So somewhere between those two figures of 38 and 89% is probably the truth. And if you look at this, there's a little graph here about experimental fidelity by week. That's from the start, when we first introduced the interventions during the implementation period, 
all the way through to the end. And you can see by the end of the study, we've achieved a 50% implementation rate. So we, things were going up throughout the course of the entire study, in other words. And had we been able to continue over, over the 25, 26 into uh, more weeks, we'd have been able to get a lot further. Uh, these were also some of the things that we experienced from the nursing staff in the course of the trial. I'm sure your uh, nurses here in Finland are much nicer and much better than the ones that we've got in the UK. Uh, some of our nurses were enthusiastic adopters and uh, adapted positively the interventions, but others of them adapted the interventions so that they wouldn't actually work. So, for example, the know each other folder ended up in the nursing office rather than out in the day room all the time, every time we visited. Uh, things were taken down from the walls as well as put up. Uh, we got a lot of ambivalence from staff. Some days you'd go, they were terribly enthusiastic, and the next day the same member of staff would be very dismissive of the sorts of things that you wanted to do, or even angry that they were being asked. Quite a bit of resistance, mild subversion, dismissiveness, talking about the interventions as if they were of no value, suggesting that these were patronizing or these couldn't possibly have any effect. And um, this research was all a waste of time. Um, although 88% of people consented to participate in research, 88% of people did not fill out all of the questionnaires and 88% of people did not fill out the end of shift questionnaire that we asked them to do at the end of every shift. So there's much less cooperation. Some refusal to participate, that's one in 10 people on the staff refused to engage at all and wouldn't have anything to do with the research even though their ward, the other people on the wards were participating. And we experienced some sabotage as well. Sometimes the stuff that we brought to the ward would go missing and we would replace the equipment and it would go missing again. And we'd replace it a third time and it would go missing again. So this was really quite deliberate in some cases. And sometimes people would start the interventions and then stop. So this is the reality of acute inpatient psychiatry in the UK, uh, ranging from enthusiasm through to exactly the opposite. And nevertheless, despite this context, we still got the results that we did. So the strengths here, it's a really strong trial. Um, there was randomization. The people were blinded to which group they were in. There was an, actually an active control intervention. Oh, quite often in these studies, there isn't any control intervention. It's just treatment as usual. It was an adequately powered study. And all of that randomization and analysis was done independently. Uh, but the weaknesses of this trial was that modest level of cooperation and implementation from the ward staff uh, and the relatively null result from the questionnaires. Uh, before I get on to the next stage of the presentation, I'll take a pause now uh, and see if you've got any questions about the results. So the question was, how did you educate the nurses in the study units to use these 10 interventions? And the second one, and how actively did they continue the use of this intervention after the study? Um, taking the last part first, I've got no way of knowing how they are continuing to use the interventions or not. I suspect in most cases not, uh, because they did them only as part of the research trial. But I also know of wards where they still do them as well. Uh, so I'm not entirely sure would be the answer to that. Uh, what support did we give them? What training did we give them? Uh, we just told them what was in the interventions and gave them the handbook, which was essentially what you've got on the website. Uh, how much training do you need to do positive words, which is say something positive about each of the patients on your ward during handover? You don't need any training to hang up the soft words posters. You just do it. You know, the whole joy of these safe words interventions is that they don't need any training, really. You can just go out, take them, go out there and do them. Okei, okay, muita kommentteja, kysymyksiä. Ehkä tuossa on se tärkeäkin pointti, niin kuin 
tämän mallin viemisestä sinne käytäntöön, niin ei siihen hirveästi treenaamista tarvita. Nämä on aika yksinkertaisia, että miten puhutaan tai sanotaan yksi positiivinen asia jokaisesta potilaasta potilasraportilla, niin sitä vaan ruvetaan tekemään. Ei sen enempää tarvitse treenausta. I should, should say, before we come to your question, and we will answer your question, um, we chose these interventions because they didn't need any training. <laughs> because if we'd have had to give people training, we would have had to take people off the wards in order to get them to training. And that was exceptionally difficult and would have cost a lot more money and we would have got much lower cooperation. Right. So there are other interventions related to safe wards that you could use. Uh, for example, something that we tried in the pilot study was to have a particular uh, assessment for uh, each individual patient for conflict and containment and for conflict and containment reduction. You know, a, a particular safety plan with a particular format. But when we tried it in the pilot study, people wouldn't do it, wouldn't cooperate with it, and it became apparent that they would need a lot more training Uh, in order to get that process underway. That would still be a good intervention to do, uh, but it's not one that we could use during the course of the trial. So we ended up with these 10 because they didn't require the training as much as anything else. Uh, not because Safe Ward says you don't need any training to reduce conflict or containment. Okay, yeah. naiset ensin ja sitten herra. Now the back row fights back. Joo, me ollaan toiminnallisesti kuntoutuksessa, niin totta kai meitä kiinnostaa, että käytettiinkö toiminnallisia menetelmiä ja kovia menetelmiä näistä liikunnassa. Okei, they... I don't know the English word for... But they are occupational people, so... And they wanted to know, did you use some occupational methods in these... Sorry. Cre or creative methods in these interventions? Um, P uh, Safe Ward seems to have unleashed a whole lot of creativity amongst psychiatric nurses and their colleagues. I'm not entirely sure why this is. Uh, partly it's the discharge messages, which is very visible, uh, and the occupational therapists who participated in our research really got hold of this idea and they They've translated it in lots and lots of different ways with lots of metaphors, sometimes really beautifully. Uh, but from my point of view, it doesn't matter whether that notice board is beautiful or not. What matters is that the messages get transmitted from one patient to another, if you see what I mean. Uh, and yet somehow that creativity is part of the interest that people have and it's part of the attention getting and it's part of the transition that, that safe wards achieves. So I, I'm really got an uncertain answer to that question. Uh, maybe you can answer it for me. I meant like uh, did those uh, nurses offer to do something creative like uh, uh, paint or use their hands, handcrafts or use music or anything creative. Um, not, not specifically. It wasn't in the 10 interventions, no. Although some of the things that were in the calm down boxes on some of the wards could be taken to be creative, creatively inspired. Not all of them, but some of them. Yeah. But it's the same thought, like, um, uh, offer something else to do so you don't think your problem so much or anxiety. Yeah, a di some of the stuff was diversional. Um, yeah, and yeah, this is a typical actual occupational therapy question about the calm down box because it so clearly relates to sensory rooms or not. Uh, when I reviewed the evidence that went into the safe wards model, the standard of evidence that existed for sensory rooms was not good enough for me to say that that would appreciably make a difference to rates of conflict and containment on the wards. And yet, uh, safe wards is, I suppose, uh, neutral on the idea of sensory modulation. We'll put anything in that box, whether it's sensory or not sensory, just as luck because for, in a safe ward sense, the important part happens as soon as you open the box and offer to do something with the patient because then you're working in collaboration with the patient to overcome 
an unwanted state of mind rather than working in opposition with the patient about trying to get them to control their own behavior. So that's the critical step in, in a safe ward sense. Then it doesn't matter whether what's in the box or not or what it is that people do because the, the member of staff and the patient are working together on the issue. You might then come back to me and say, well, there are certain things that might be in that box that might work better than others. And I'd say, fine. Well, if you can produce the evidence or you think that's the case, put in the box whatever you like. It's the fact that you have it and can negotiate with patients, I think, that's important from my point of view. Uh, well, as you saw in the picture, uh, there was one ward that had accumulated five or six boxes, and that was because patients who went home on leave would bring stuff back to put in the boxes, say this would be a good thing to have, make this available to, to the rest of the patients on the ward. And eventually the staff had to tell them, stop, no more stuff. On it, were the results different in different kind of wards? Say, how did that intensive care psychiatric units do it? Uh, our study was not powered sufficiently to make any deductions about the impact on different sorts of wards. So we didn't even look at that. In a related sense, we didn't look at the, specific, the impact on specific types of conflict and containment either, because we would have needed much bigger studies to answer those particular questions. You, know, you would have needed a lot of psychiatric and ordin intensive care units and other wards to really say whether there was going to be any difference there or not. We knew from our previous research that these wards operated sufficiently similarly for the trial to be done across all of them and to show an effect, and that's what we're presenting to you today. Okay, eli oli hyvä kysymys, että oliko sitten eri osastojen välillä vielä eroja näissä tuloksissa, mutta tässä ei ollut niin paljon eri osastoja, että olisi pystynyt tekemään tällaista tilastollista analyysiä, että on katsottu sitä kokonaisuutta. Okei, okay, Len, one question about the time, timetable. We have to give three minutes to Ryan, three minutes to Päivi and two minutes to Tero. So, how much do you need? Five more minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. I promise. Safe Wards is very popular. Half of England is committed to using it. Uh, people are doing it in Holland, they're doing it in Germany, uh, they're doing it across a whole state in Australia, they're doing it in Switzerland, New Zealand, uh, Canada, the hospital in Reykjavik is doing it, oh, somewhere in Helsinki is doing it, where would that be? Kalikoski Hospital, uh, and they're doing it in Turkey and Istanbul as well. It's got into UK government policy already, so it's in, <coughs> in, in our policy documents. Uh, nurses are pretty much very enthusiastic about it when I present it to them. Uh, and there's some more pictures of various safe wards implementers and their teams and the nurses who are working on safe wards uh, and various people having, uh, I think this was uh, a hospital in the Isle of Wight in the south of, the, <coughs> of England were meeting to actually plan their safe wards implementation and what they were going to do first. Uh, patients get safe wards and love it. So some of our greatest supporters have been service user groups because they really, really understand safe wards. They understand the 10 interventions just as you do uh, and what rationale they have and how they would potentially make a difference to the everyday interactions between patients and staff. This patient was moved to write to the chief executive of their hospital saying how empowering and how powerful the mutual help meeting was for patients on the ward. I'm not going to read that out in detail because I'll waste all of my five minutes and it'll be gone. Uh, this is uh, one of the teams on Charlesworth Ward in Lincoln. Uh, they've received a visit from a bunch of nurses from Finland who've been here yeah, with you were there yeah. with Charlesworth Ward. They're a great team of people. Now, this is important for you to know. If you turn out those reductions in safe wards, into cash value, if you think about the time that we spend on dealing with conflict and containment, and then you take that 15% drop in conflict and that 24% drop in containment and turn it into a cash value of nursing time, it turns into a saving of 110,000 euros a year, which is equivalent to two extra members of staff in the UK. Uh, you're probably paid so well here in Finland that that's only equivalent to one member of staff, I don't know. 
Is that true? No. 110, well, how much will, how many nursing staff will 110,000 euros get me? Two and a half, so it's good. This is good value then in that case. So this is, a, if I came to you today and said you could have an extra two members of staff on your wards each, would you all go away happy? Yeah, I'm going to get a few small uh, sort of Finnish sort of nods in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you'd be very happy. Well, I'm saying you can do the same. If you implement safe wards, you free up the equivalent of two members of staff on your team. And that means you can invest that time in much better and more productive things to do. So if you want to find out more, there's a Safe Wards channel on YouTube. Uh, there's little videos about each of the interventions. There's recordings of webinars about each of the interventions. Uh, there are recordings of nurses and managers who are implementing Safe Wards talking about the process. Uh, and I am hoping that at some point we'll, we'll get some finished videos up there. So if you go out there and implement Safe Wards, please make some video recordings and we'll put them up on the YouTube channel in Finnish or in whatever language you like, in fact. If you want to follow us on Twitter, you can follow us on Twitter. We've got a Safe Wards channel on Twitter, and Safe Wards is on Facebook. Uh, would you take the official photograph, please, Lowry? Lowry is now going to take a photograph of you. You're going on Facebook later on today. Uh, if you don't want to go on Facebook, look down or cover your face or go like this or whatever. OK, so everybody say face, no Facebook. Safe Wards. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, it says 1,500 plus international members there. I looked this morning, it's 2,100 and it's increasing all of the time. And of course, because I've been making a few presentations this week in Finland, the number of Finnish members is getting uh, more and more quite quickly. Uh, this is the, um, the main website that Lowry's already uh, introduced you to, and as you know, it's been translated uh, into Finnish now, but it's available in a number of other different languages as well. People visit that worldwide, and it's got the, everything in there, everything you need to know about the 10 interventions. If you do all the 10 interventions, it's got the full details of the 30. If you do all of the 30, uh, then it's got more information about our long list of nearly 300. And if you do all of those, it's got all of the model information so that you can create your own interventions and go on renewing safe wards as long as you like. So there's a whole range of different things you can do and keep acting in order to reduce levels of conflict and containment on your wards to the bare minimum. Now, I'm not suggesting that there is any intervention that any researcher will ever come up with that will make or transform all of your patients into calm and lovely individuals who are never aggressive, never get angry and irritated, never harm themselves and behave absolutely perfectly uh, and that we can throw away all of our medication and, in fact, dismantle psychiatry and all go home and get retrained for different jobs. It's never going to happen. Uh, but we can get to a much better place than we are at the moment. And the way to get to that better place is to use the evidence that we have to give the, the care that is less likely to give rise or to engage us in the use of containment. Uh, and these are the principles that I'm handing over to you today. Uh, and if your ward won't agree to work with you on safe wards, then you can just think about implementing them yourself in your own personal practice. And in fact, if you're in the audience and you're not a nurse, you happen to be a psychiatrist or a social worker or a psychologist who doesn't have that much involvement with wards, you can still think about these principles in your own individual practice, about your own interactions with patients and how you can move in a to a kind of a less confrontational practice in your style of interactions and work. So there you are, brand new uh, explanatory model of conflict and containment on wards. It's available free. Now, you don't have to pay me. You don't have to pay Lowry. Uh, you don't have to do any training. Or it's all there free for you to use, uh, for you to engage with and all of the resources are available that you could possibly need. The only thing that I ask of you is if you do do this, that you participate and encourage other people, not just within, uh, within Finland, but worldwide. 
That means engaging in the different forums on uh, social media that are available. And it means things like making your own video recordings and sharing them with other people, hosting visits from other places in the world and other places in Finland, showing them what you do, and sharing good practice. Because that's also part of what Safe Wards is about. Uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much.